The Big Story. Three men entered the cozy corner barbecue in Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania at 1 a.m. You, Kiva? Yeah, that's right. Okay, let's have it. Well, what do you do? The cash register, Kiva, the cash register. Wait. What are you waiting for? He's... He's laying on the cash register. Well, push him off. You got hands, ain't you? There's money in that register. There was money in that register. Eight dollars. The three men left, leaving Kiever behind. Dead. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The story of a murder and of a reporter who befriended the loneliest man on earth. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The story as it actually happened. Ray Spriggle's story as he lived it. This was before you won the Pulitzer Prize, Ray Spriggle, reporter for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Before your brilliant and humane work on behalf of the underprivileged of America. But even then, a few years back, the same unmistakable signs were there. The perception, the respect for facts, the sympathy for other human beings. The woman at your desk sitting on the edge of her chair was 35. Maybe she was younger. What she'd been through made her look like, well, 35. And the story came out haltingly, as if it hurt to open the wound she carried. Her name was Hortense Grayson. That name Grayson doesn't mean much to you, Mr. Spriggle. No, I don't think so. No, I guess almost nobody remembers. Six years ago, Mr. Spriggle, my husband was arrested for robbery. He broke into a doctor's office, and he and two other men... Clem Grayson. That's right. You said robbery. He's in for murder. That's right, Mr. Spriggle. He has a life sentence for murder. A murder he never committed. Maybe I ought to tell you first why I came to you. You see, your name... Well, maybe this doesn't sound like anything to you, but I... I read your articles, Mr. Spriggle. Well, we can I... skip that. No, I'd like to say it. I think if there's anyone in Pittsburgh who can do anything, you're that man. I, I don't say you'll help me. Let's get back to the story, shall we? I told you my husband was a robber, and I told you that he was arrested for a murder which he never committed. I want to tell you this, too. I divorced him three years ago. Oh? And what's a woman who divorced her husband doing fighting for his release? Well, the answer is just that I know he's innocent. He didn't do it. Well, suppose you tell me all about it now. Well, my husband and these two other men, Kramer and Jensen, were picked up after they robbed the doctor's office. That was in Cambria County. There was no question about his guilt, and the trial was quick. He was sentenced to ten years. Yeah. He hadn't been in prison a week when witnesses came forward and testified that he and the other two men that robbed the doctor's office had also killed this man, Kiever, in his barbecue place three weeks before. The other two were guilty. They're now in jail, but Clem... Clem wasn't at Kiever's place that night. I was sick in bed, and he took care of me, and... There were two other people in the house playing cards with Clem. They swear he never left the house. Is there any evidence outside of the statement that you've made and your friends? That's the terrible part. You see, Kramer, one of the men who killed Kiever, he admitted that Clem wasn't there that night. He wrote out a confession. And Jensen, the other killer, he admitted it to me that Clem wasn't there, but he wouldn't write a confession. And, and the court transcript. 
If you read the transcript, the way the witnesses changed their minds. He's innocent, Mr. Sprinkle, and I can't do anything about it. You'll pardon this question, uh, Mrs. Uh... Grayson, hmm. I still use his name. Do you have anything besides your word for all this? Oh, I, I brought it all here, Mr. Sprinkle. Transcript, confession, statements of witnesses. If you'd only read it, I don't know. Write a story. Okay, I'll... just put it down on the desk. I'll read it, and maybe I will write a story. Now, uh, tell me one thing. Why did you divorce him? I don't want to talk about it. Do I have to talk about it? No, that's okay. That's okay, Mrs. Grayson. Maybe it's as phony as a three-dollar bill. But even if it is, even if everything she says is pure, unadulterated fabrication, it's a pretty good story. A divorced woman seeks to free ex-mate. Not bad. Not bad. And on that somewhat cynical, somewhat casual note, Ray Spriggle, you get involved. Well, I suppose we might as well start here. Confession of George Kramer. We come in at Kiva's place, one o'clock. We told him, give us what's in the register. He went for a gun and Roger shot him. When we left, we counted the money. It was eight dollars. So me and Jensen and Rogers went home. Clem Grayson wasn't there. Depositions of convicted men aren't very much, you know. But when a man in prison for life admits he was involved in a murder and thereby jeopardizes his chance for parole or pardon... Hey, maybe there's something here. Sworn statement of Robert and William Billings. My brother Robert and I play poker regular with Clem Grayson. The night of the Kiva killing, we started at 9.30 in his kitchen. His wife was sick in the bedroom. We played till 2.15. We remember because when we were finished, I said to my brother, five hours to lose 35 bucks. That ain't very smart. Transcript of testimony. Case of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus Clem Grayson. Ah, here's the section. The attorney then examined the witness, Briggs. You positively identify the defendant, Grayson, as one of the trio? Yes, sir. I was eating a barbecue sandwich. But sir. you didn't identify Grayson when you were first taken to the county jail. Oh, I'll have to acknowledge I was a little confused. But now, you're absolutely certain. Absolutely. Uh, the reason I didn't then was I, uh, I guess I was slightly muddled. Hmm. What makes you certain now? Well, I thought it over, and I had a talk with the sergeant in charge, and he convinced me, and now I'm absolutely certain. Well, I had a talk with the sergeant and thought I was muddled before, now I'm absolutely certain. Gets more interesting all along. Now, let's see. Testimony of Nellie Swenson, waitress, Cozy Corner Barbecue. Is it a fact, Miss Swenson, that you were asked at the preliminary hearing, can you tell who was standing in the doorway with the gun? Yes, sir. What did you say? I said I couldn't tell exactly because, you see, he had his coat collar up and his hat down, and I didn't watch his face. I watched his gun. That's what you said at the preliminary hearing some weeks ago. Now, what did you testify to a few minutes ago? I can't exactly remember. I shall refresh your memory. You said, quote, the man I saw was Clem Grayson, unquote. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How do you explain your revamping your testimony? I can't. During the recess a few minutes ago, did you talk to the prosecutor in this case? Yes, I did. Louder, please. Yes, I did. Will you please tell the court what it was you talked to the prosecutor about? I object. The court 
court sustained the objection on the grounds that the content of the conversation was immaterial. Immaterial? It's the most material thing on earth. This is fantastic. Edna. Edna, get me Mrs. Grayson on the phone. Mrs. Grayson, if I look like a man who's controlling himself, that's just what I am. I've seldom seen anything so blatant, so open and shut, so... What are you crying about? It's nothing, Mr. Sprinkle. It's just that I'll... I'll be all right in a second. No, no, no. Cut that out. It's just that you're the first person in six years who understood. You've been on this six years? First, I took it to the prosecuting attorney. He told me to take it to the sheriff of Westmoreland. I went to the sheriff. He told me to take it to the state police at Harrisburg. At Harrisburg, they told me to see the governor. The governor's a busy man. I saw the second assistant to the lieutenant governor, and he told me to take it to the prosecuting attorney. And that's what you've been doing for six years? Six years, five months, and 19 days. Now tell me why. Why, what? You know what I'm talking about. Why, after being divorced, do you keep the name? A murderer's name. Why have you kept going at it for six years, five months, and 19 days? You love the guy? No. If this was a movie, that would be the reason. I don't love Clem. I guess I haven't loved Clem for a long time. The reason is Kathy. Kathy's our daughter, Mr. Spriggle, and wild horses couldn't get me out. But after the way you've talked, I, I think you ought to know. Kathy was about four at the time Clem was sent up. You see, I found out that a grown woman can put a man out of her life if she wants to, but a child can't. And Clem was in her life whether I liked it or not. And as she grew older, she's ten now, ten and a half, there got to be a lot of questions. Other girls have fathers. She has no father. And what am I going to tell her when she grows into young womanhood? What's she going to tell her friends? That her father's a convict? That he's in prison for murder? She'll have to lie and evade it, and that'll warp her. I don't want that. I don't want that, especially because her father's innocent. So you see, I didn't solve anything by divorcing Clem. I'm beginning to understand. And if he's free, what will she be able to say? She'll say, my parents are divorced. My father and mother never got along. I live with my mother, but I hear from my father all the time. He's working in... Cleveland or Boston or California? If she can say that, Mr. Sprinkle, that's all I want. Yeah. Well, suppose we see what we can do, Mrs. Grayson. Let's see if there really is such a thing as power of truth. <laughs> a good story, and a big one. And you, Ray Spriggle, reporter for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, do it in three installments, three big half pages, setting forth the affidavits, the confessions, and the conflicting testimony. And you wait and see what the power of truth is. You also go a step further. With Mrs. Grayson, you help prepare the papers for the pardon board. Don't worry now, don't worry. I think we've got one of the finest cases ever presented. Let's go in, Mrs. Grayson. After due and careful consideration of this pardon board, it is our considered judgment that 
The confession of the convicted murderer Kramer is inconclusive. That internal conflict within the testimony of witnesses has been demonstrated, but is insufficient. And let it be remembered that the prisoner seeking this pardon, Clem Grayson, is not only an admitted robber, but has been found guilty of murder by a jury of his peers. Pardon denied. <laughs> Now you begin to understand those six years, five months, and 19 days. This isn't a matter of simple justice. This isn't a matter of the power of truth or the press. The law is a highly technical, complex, careful business. And so you bring into the case an old friend, Tom Endor, lawyer. It's a good case, Ray. Good. But, uh, not good enough. What more do you want, Tom? Well, if you could get the jury, each one of the jurors, that'll be something. If you could show about six more cracks in the testimony of the witnesses, that would be something. If you could get Jensen, the third guy, to confess, that, I guess, would be... Almost conclusive. Almost? That's what I said, almost. Oh, what are you trying to do, make it tougher than it is? No, my friend, I am merely trying to make it precisely as tough as the pardon board made it. Okay, I begin to understand. Now, about you. Now, what about me? Will you see this thing through with me? <laughs> what do you think I'm doing here, twiddling my thumb? There's no money. Grayson hasn't got any. Neither is Mrs. Grayson, and all I can do is take you out for a shot once in a while. Oh, cut it out. And as far as publicity goes, you guys need publicity. Don't kid me, Tom. You might come in for some, shall we say, adverse publicity? What do we stand around talking for? The guy's in jail. You move now. First in the Westmoreland County dives, pool rooms, flop houses. And there, when you ask the question, you get a common answer. <laughs> you kidding, bud? Grayson never done that job. That was Rogers. Rogers all the way. Kramer, Jensen, and Rogers. Everybody says the same thing, Tom. Everywhere I go, Kramer, Jensen, and Rogers. What about Rogers? He's the third of the trio. No, I know that. I mean, uh, what's he doing now? Well, the court didn't believe he was mixed up with the killing, so he never went to jail. Now he's a small-town political out in Cambria County. Can you get anything on him? Well, look at a sheriff friend out there. You, you mean what I just told you was no good? It's common gossip. Rogers did it. Look, I'll say it to you once more. The law is no layman's game. Specific, full-blown evidence is needed. What's gossip, what they say in the gin mills and the flop houses doesn't go very far in court or with a pardon board. Try your sheriff friend. Break down Rogers. Get Jensen to admit that Grayson wasn't in on it. Then come back, and we'll talk about what to do. Hey, this is tough. You move again. This time more slowly, carefully. And it takes time. A month, six months, a year, two years. Finally, four years have gone by since Mrs. Grayson first came into your office. A thing you thought would take a few articles in the paper. And even now, after four years, all you've got to show is... Sheriff, you've got to get me something on Rogers. You've got to. Ray, there's nothing on earth I'd like to do better than put Rogers where he belongs. I'm sure he was the one who murdered Keever, and you know it. There's no proof. Look, I know all about proof. Can't we get something on him? For the past four years, I've watched Rogers. And all I can tell you is that the average choir boy has gotten into more trouble. But if anything shows up, I'll get in touch with him. What kind of a human being are you, Jensen? I ain't a human being. I'm a convict. I'm in for murder. Look, Jensen, you know Grayson had nothing to do with the murder. You know Rogers did it. Kramer admitted it. Why don't you give the guy a break? He served ten years. Yeah? How long do you think I served? There's an innocent man rotting in jail. So I'm a guilty man rotting in jail. Why don't you try your story on Rogers? He might listen to you. 
Me, I am too busy. Rogers? My name is Armand T. Rogers. I like to be called by my name, you don't mind? You're pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Sitting pretty. You don't care that Grayson didn't do it, that he's taken the rap for you. You don't care about anything. I wouldn't say that, Mr. Spriggle. I like a good cigar, I like music, and I like fine food. About Grayson, sure I care. I care the same way as when a fly gets in my way and I gotta kill him and flick him off. And it goes on. Now the four years have become five. The five have become six. Every two years, you and attorney Tom Endor have gone before the pardon board. Three times you've gone, and three times you've heard the words, pardon denied. Who's there? It's me. Oh, you. Well, you'll be pleased to know they've turned us down a third time, Mrs. Grayson. What are you smiling about? What, what's the, what is it to smile about? You know what they say about women, Mr. Sprinkle? Oh, cut it out now. What are you talking about? About how weak we are. We can't do anything by ourselves. What have you got? I went to see Jensen today. I told him the pardon board had turned down Clem's plea the third time. And what do you think he did? You got it? He said, gee, I thought the pardon board would give it to him long ago, but I guess they won't. So he sat down and wrote a full confession, clearing Clem. Oh, aren't you happy? Aren't you pleased? Isn't this what we were after? Now, look, I got a lot older since you first saw me. Six years ago, I would have turned handsprings. Now I want to be sure. The confession is great. It's terrific. But before we go back to that pardon border, I want to have an absolutely airtight case. What more can we possibly get? Rogers. I'm waiting for Rogers to crack. Meantime, Clem's in jail. Now, believe me. Please believe me. Let's make sure we get him out. So you said, with a sworn confession of Jensen, making two sworn confessions, that Clem Grayson is innocent and Rogers is guilty. You wait for the call which finally comes. Spriggle speaking. Gray, come on over. I got something to tell you. Rogers? Roger. And so you finally slipped, Rogers. You beat up your wife last night. You beat her up and put her in the hospital for a month. Look, I don't have to sit here and listen to you. That's where you're wrong. The sheriff said stay with him as long as you like, Ray. That's me, Ray. Till you get just what you want. And just what I want is a signed confession that you killed Kiva. You, not Clem Grayson. I never killed Kiva. Should I read you the confession of Kramer? The whole thing with every one of its lousy, sordid details? You want to hear the confession of Jensen? How he says you were the one pushed the body off the cash register and took the money out? I don't care what you got to say. Shall I tell you what your wife told me and the sheriff about that night, about your alibi? They're liars. Both of them liars. Okay, Rogers, do it the hard way. Get in court and face them. Everything about the murder will come out, every dirty piece of it. A confession would have made it much easier for you, but you won't talk. Well, Rogers, it'll be a pleasure, a great pleasure to take you apart, bit by bit, in a courtroom right in front of the whole world. And on a winter day, a little later, you and Hortense Grayson wait as the chairman of the pardon board says the inevitable words, setting Clem Grayson free. The wheels of justice grind slow sometimes. In this case, 12 years, 5 months, 22 days. But the important thing is, they do grind. Now 
Now we read you that telegram from Ray Spriggle of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Grayson granted full pardon on the murder conviction. When released, he quickly enlisted in the United States Army and served overseas with distinction. Rogers, the actual killer, was convicted and sentenced to a long term in the Western Penitentiary for his complicity in the murder. And so ends another big story. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter. presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs>